It's Christmas time again, the time of joy and togetherness. Unless you're a conservative, then it's the time of anger. Anger that a library in a town that you've never heard of didn't have a Christmas tree. <laughs> like anyone who watches Fox News has been to a library. We've won the first battle in the war on Christmas. Today, the tiny town of Dedham, Massachusetts, decided that their library will, in fact, put up their annual Christmas tree after some pressure from prime time. So how did we get here? Well, last week, we told you about a Scrooge named Amber Maroney. She's the town's library director, and she banned Christmas trees because they made people feel, quote, uncomfortable. You see, to some people, there's nothing more offensive than twinkling lights on a Douglas fir. So there was no way the tree could go up this year. Look at last year's tree. How offensive. Oh, thank God. This guy single-handedly saved Christmas. He's a regular Ernest P. Worrell. Air breaks. <laughs> Anger that people are celebrating Christmas, but without the church part. The original voice of Disney's Buzz Lightyear and the star of the Santa Claus movies, Alan told The Wrap, the series puts Christ back into Christmas. It originally had a lot of um, otherworldly characters and ghosts and goblins. I said, no, this is Christ Mass. It's Christ Mass. It's a, it literally is a religious holiday. We don't have to blow trumpets, but I do want you to acknowledge it. That's what this mm -hmm. is about. If you want to get into Santa Claus, you're going to have to go back to history, and it's all about religion. Anger that sometimes boys kiss boys and girls kiss girls, even at Christmas time. We, we, we used to binge watch uh, Hallmark Christmas movies every December, and then a few years ago, they start putting all this LGB, and they bowed to society, and they were one of the most family-friendly, I'm not saying they were perfect, but... They were one of the most family-friendly networks out there, and then even them. I just want to point out, too, that he corrected his own grammar there. I didn't add that caption. I just wanted to clear that up because I have terrible grammar at times, and I don't want to receive a list in my email. Caved to the mob. So, you know, we stopped watching Hallmark uh, altogether. Oh, you really seem like you're in the Christmas spirit. You mean the Christmas spirit? <laughs> oh, right. You don't care about Jesus because you worship Hallmark. Oh, boy. <laughs> two men falling in love or two women falling in love is just as family friendly as a man and a woman falling in love. I think the root of this anger is a little thing we call envy. Envy that they are no longer the center of attention all the time. Envy that other religions also have a say now. Envy that the people they don't like are also getting the rights that they've always had. And envy for a time where people like them were on top of the world. But a lot of these people are also the same people who think that envy is a sin. So how does that work? Extra, extra, read all about it. You can't even say Merry Christmas anymore. Is that, is that true? I mean, we talked about it at the beginning of the show, but is that true? You can't say Merry Christmas anymore? Is there a war on Christmas? What news outlets are talking about that story? Huh. If only there was a website or an app that you could go to and you could see which side of the uh, political spectrum each story is coming from. And that, my friends is why I am thankful for today's sponsor. Our sponsor today is Ground News. What Ground News does is they take a story and they filter it down. They show you exactly who's covering it and how they're covering it. You can see the headlines, but you can also see, oh, is it just left-leaning news sources? Is it just right-leaning news sources? So it's a great way to compare and see what the biases are on each story. And if it's just, you know, a certain political leaning side that's trying to project their narrative. Uh, you go on their website, you see the story, and then you can see, oh, look, there, uh, there's a story there. And here are all the different news outlets covering it. And here's where they stand politically. Is the left ignoring it? Is the right ignoring it? Yeah, this is a really interesting way to look at the news, and uh, I think it's something that's long overdue. And uh, yeah, it's exciting that uh, we can we have something uh, that we can access like this. So for you, go to ground.news/belief 
to get fully informed about what's going on in this crazy world. Um, and it's the holiday season. So you know what that means? 35% off the premium unlimited version. I think it's a great tool, and I think you're going to like it. And now, back to me wearing a different hat. Hey, everybody. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Happy Kwanzaa. Happy Hanukkah. Merry Yule. Happy Solstice. All the things. Uh, You're all wonderful. Thank you so much for liking and subscribing and commenting. All those wonderful things, because you are wonderful people. And I hope you have just a joyous, joyous season. Recently, my niece showed me Be Real, and then my friends told me about TikTok Now. The problem with both of these are that they always go up when I'm sitting on my computer, on the couch, watching a sermon or editing a video, and every picture would just be me on the couch and my cat on the cat tree across from me. And yes, people should always want to see pictures of my cat, but nobody wants to see me on a couch every day. Social media already makes it so we see a lot of people's lives. What is this, an iPhone 9? (laughs) It's like a Walkman. I don't know nothing about this. That's before my time. It's called envy. Uh, Now, actually, in our world, it's worse because we're on social media and we're all like, why are all those people hanging out? They're all having fun. They're all taking pictures. I didn't get the phone call. Or, man, they went all to Hawaii again. Like, when's the last time I went to Hawaii? Why isn't my husband working harder so I can go? Or the wife working harder. Either one. And, And here is this, like, little insidious sin. Envy. I want that life. I want that husband who could give me that. I want that wife who could give me that. I want those kids that could give me that. I want that job, that life. I want that because it'll satisfy me. It'll make my life better and it'll make me look better and feel better. And it's endless. It's never ending. And here's what the Bible says. That kills our soul and it kills our relationship with God and it kills our relationship with the world. I went on Instagram the other day. And I saw, I saw um, Kevin Hart, and I felt like a failure in my whole life. Yeah, why would you compare yourself to Kevin Hart in any way at all? You have zero in common. Or maybe, are you short? That's the only thing I can think of. I don't even know how tall you are. I felt like, what am I doing with my whole life? What, what is the point of my existence within 15 seconds, here I am with a burden on me that I wasn't built for by comparing myself to someone with a different calling. And please don't judge me while I am in this vulnerable position. Because the truth of the matter is, some of you are hurting in ways that you don't have to hurt because you are putting yourself in a position that you were not built to live in. Jesus said, I'm not going to Judea because you want me to go to Judea. I don't have to post it to prove it. I don't have to turn stones into bread to show that I'm the Son of God. I live out of purpose, not for popularity. I live out of purpose, not for the praises of men, but for the praise that can only come from God. People in this congregation worship this man. They hang on every uninteresting thing this guy has to say. If you uh, go watch the David Fincher movie, which I'm not telling you to go watch, called Seven, which is a serial killer killing people based on the seven deadly sins. I don't want to spoil the movie for you, so if you don't, you know, haven't seen the movie and you actually want to watch it, maybe skip this in the next 10 seconds, but the murder that actually is about envy is when the serial killer kills the wife of one of the main characters because he envied his life. This is what it does to us, and yet what the gospel saves us from. Sorry, is he saying that the lesson to be learned from the movie Seven is that you shouldn't be envious because you might put Gwyneth Paltrow's head in a box? I envy your normal life. Put the gun down, David. It seems that envy is my sin. No, oh, what's in the box? Not until you give me the What's gun. in the f***ing box? I think he just wanted to bring up a movie from 1995 to sound relevant, because this adds nothing to the sermon. Hey, Trevor, just a little memo for the future. Maybe don't criticize people for using uh, irrelevant clips 
when uh, trying to prove their point because um, that's kind of like uh, the pot calling the kettle black. Okay, back to your regular scheduled video. My buddy, uh, a couple weeks ago, he was out hunting and he actually got attacked by a grizzly bear. Survived, he's got stitches, 50 stitches in his face, his legs all, you know, gnarled up. And like, he could have got killed. He got in between a grizzly and the, the cubs. That's what envy's like. It's this thing that will maul you and others and your relationship with God if you don't kill it first. Because envy leads us to desire the harm of another person. We, 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 we nurse grudges about them. We brood over things. We lick our wounds. We gossip about them. We plan revenge. Envy is like being attacked by a bear? Wait, are we the bear or is the bear envy? I don't think this guy should do sermon illustrations anymore. Envy is therefore, according to this passage, a formidable sin. Envy is a formidable sin, and it's a sneaky one. Sneaky, sneaky, sir. And it's a sneaky one even when it's out in plain sight. Even when it's operating in the open, people can still deny that that's what's going on. That's much harder to do with drunkenness or with adultery. I was actually very good at hiding my drinking. I do live alone, so that part was easier, but alcoholism can be a secret. And uh, I think... I think most of the time adultery is a secret. I think most of the time people hide it. That's kind of like the thing with adultery. When people are in that kind of sin, they are sinning in the sin, and the sin is obvious. Paul tells us that some men's sins go before them, other men's sins come behind them. This is one of those things that, where there's plausible deniability. I'm not envious. I'm not envious. I just care about the principle of the matter. The principle is what matters. I don't care that he got the promotion. It's the principle of the thing. The great tradition refers to envy as one of the capital sins, the deadly sins if you want. But I like capital from caput, meaning head. It means it's a kind of fountainhead of other sins and other dysfunctions. If I'm I'm racked by jealousy. I'm racked by envy. That's going to give rise to all kinds of nasty stuff, isn't it? I'm going to start gossiping about other people. I mean, why do we gossip? Well, because we want to keep people down. We want to destroy their reputations because they might get ahead of us. It gives rise to real cruelty. You know what I'm talking about, fellow sinners. Fellow sinners? Oh, gosh, he's one of us, a priest, no less, who sins? This guy is relatable. Who ever heard of a priest who sins before? We'll do very cruel things precisely because we don't want someone getting ahead of us. We might be very aggressive or we might be more subtle, like trying to destroy someone's reputation. Yeah, envy is a capital sin from the caput, from the head. Okay, so now we're getting into it. Envy is bad because it can cause bad things. Kind of like how dancing is bad because it leads to kissing, and kissing, of course, leads to sex. If our Lord wasn't testing us, how would you account for the proliferation these days of this obscene rock and roll music with its gospel of easy sexuality and relaxed morality? It is coveting that so often leads to evil. Or to put it another way, coveting is what leads to violating the preceding four commandments, the ones against murder, adultery, stealing, and perjury. Think about it. Why do people do those things? In most instances, it's because they covet something that belongs to another person. That's got to stop. Right. Right? Yeah, because it's a gateway. It's the finish line. Oh, there's worse stuff. In the Bible, whenever envy moves... Whenever envy moves, somebody gets hurt. Whenever envy appears, someone is in danger. Joseph's brothers were envious of him, and so they uh, sold him into slavery, into Egypt. Pilate saw that, that the Jews were envious of Jesus, and that's why he was on trial for his life in front of Pilate. Pilate was a pagan, and he understood the dynamics of what was going on better than the Jews who were turning Jesus over to him. So in the Bible, whenever envy moves, violence and coercion 
are not far off. Anyone else uncomfortable with the way he says Jews here and uh, the implications that they uh, don't know things good? Do not covet anything that belongs to others. Not their spouse, their house, their servants, their animals, or any of their property. And so if you're keeping track here, we are supposed to get our morals from a book that counts wives and slaves as property that are not to be coveted. And uh, yes, he does say spouse and servants, but that is not what the most accurate translations say. In order to understand this commandment and its unique significance, the first thing to understand is that this is the only one of the Ten Commandments that legislates thought. All the other commandments legislate behavior. Yup. This is a thought crime. Not the only thought crime in the Bible, but the only one in the Ten Commandments. Which means that, according to them, you can be tortured for eternity for having a bad thought. Because envy is a sin deeply ingrained in human nature that will destroy your life. It comes into being when we lack certain things. We're envious of others regarding a hundred things. Wealth, power, beauty, right? Spouses, right? You, you go through the Bible and you see all kinds of examples of this. Women are envious of other women for their fertility. Why can't I have a baby? Has that been you? Men look at other men and they see their social ascent and they go, why can't I be powerful and successful like him? Okay, I'm writing a sermon here. I got to figure out what do women desire? Mm, ba baby? I'm going to go with uh, fertility. And obviously men desire power and wealth, but for women, it's babies. And don't get me wrong, I know couples who have been heartbroken over the fact that they are unable to conceive, and it is super sad. I feel for them. But come on, your default is women want babies and men want good jobs? And also, what is that he said about human nature? Because envy is a sin deeply ingrained in human nature. It's deeply ingrained in human nature. Sin is a wild concept. How could something that is ingrained in our very nature be a sin? Again, something worthy of eternal punishment. Jealousy. Jealousy starts at a very young age, wow. doesn't it? I mean, parents can have one child, yeah. but as soon as that second one comes along, you start mm -hmm. seeing that jealousy in oh, there, yeah. you it's, know? Mm -hmm. it, so, but it... it Hey everybody, uh, so welcome to this planning meeting for our new Christian TV show. It's uh, basically a Christian version of The View, and uh, we're going to start coming up with names. I think that's our first step, is to come up with a name. So it's a Christian version of The View. Uh, yes, Billy. Uh, I was thinking, what if we called it The Christian View? Perfect. Meeting's over. It starts early, but it never goes away. It's something we have to deal with our entire life. It's a disease. Absolutely. And, you know, Jackie, I read that uh, reports say that uh, it starts when we're babies. Mm -hmm. Jealous of our mother's attention. Jealous of yeah. uh, wa wanting her to hold us. And, mm -hmm. and that yeah. we're born with it. Mm -hmm. and, and the Bible says that it's cruel. That's what it says oh, about jealousy. God. It is wow. just flat down cruel. I Maybe we are born with envy, not because we are terrible little sinning babies, but because envy has helped our ancestors survive and we've kept that trait. Hey, that person has something I need to survive. Let me find out how that person got that. Hey, that person ate more than their share, and if I let that happen, I may not survive the winter. And of course there are some negative aspects to it, but we work through that. We go to therapy. We work on ourselves. We don't beat ourselves up and say we are wicked sinners with a problem. This is our natural tendency. It is a universal problem. We were born casting sidelong glances. We were born casting sidelong glances. What, what does she have? What does he have? Why did I not get that? Why am I going without? And they have. This is our natural tendency, universal problem. But let's talk about kids for a minute. What do we traditionally do if kids are fighting over something? Quite often, what we do is we sit them down and we talk to the kids about the importance of sharing. If they're fighting over toys, you don't say, Jenny gets all the toys and Becky can play with the stick. That's not good parenting. You find a way so that all the kids can play and you teach them a valuable lesson. <laughs> But as adults, we say that the person with less is just envious, or the person pointing out the system isn't fair is just being envious. You ever 
like sat with yourself and gone, I was dealt a bad hand. There were social reasons for my life not turning out like theirs. And for some of you, that's true. But nine times out of 10, it's not true. It's your life. Maybe you worked for this or you didn't catch a few breaks and they did, whatever. But the foundational reality in that is it's comparative and you have to stop. Now, I get it. It's in all of us. Maybe more than any other sin, envy is us. Nine times out of 10 seems a little high, but even if that's right, that's 10%. Those 10% of people still deserve a shot. If the system is rigged so that 10% of the people don't get a shot at success, then maybe we do something about it. So the whole so social justice agenda that is rampaging through our culture now runs on envy and nothing but. Nothing but envy? Not wanting equal rights, not wanting to give a voice to the voiceless, not wanting people to have food, not wanting people to have basic empathy. It's all based on envy. Envy. It becomes a collector of injustices, both real and imagined. Since envy cannot speak its own name, the closest virtue capable of camouflaging the sin is zeal for social justice. You can be a, a social justice warrior, and nobody will call you on it. Really? No one will call you out on being a social justice warrior? I've been called an SJW a few times, and to me, it's just a weird insult, to be honest. I think the idea is that some people have been a little cringy in their messaging, so now anyone who cares about people is a cringy SJW? Am I getting that right? But in reality, I don't see a reason to feel insulted when someone points out that I want to improve the world that I live in. Nobody will say, you've got this aching wound in your heart. You've got this wound that's like a open chest wound, and you're trying to fill it with activity. You're trying to fill it with this virtuous sounding activity. No. Since true Christians should be very much concerned with genuine justice, biblical justice, justice biblically defined. Since we should be concerned about that, we should, whenever we hear the word justice, we should immediately think, what, what are you talking about? What are, you, are you talking about biblical justice? Are you talking about biblical law? Are you talking about the law word of God? Or are you talking about our envy? Envy is bad. Envy causes social justice. Therefore, social justice is bad. It is not unjust for someone else to make more money than you. It's not unjust for someone to get better grades than you. It's not unjust for someone to be a foot taller than you. How is that unjust? But it is unjust to get that money in unfair ways. It is unjust if people get better grades because the conditions of the school in their rich neighborhood are better than the conditions of the school in the low income or minority area. But exciting. We about to be on TV. Because they are covering underfunded, poorly managed public schools in America. No press is bad press, Barb. Look at Mel Gibson. Still thriving. <laughs> Daddy's home too. Hilarious. <laughs> and no one thinks it's unjust for somebody to be taller, that's just straw manning so you can end the conversation in righteous indignation. That's not unjust at all. It is, it, it is unjust if envy is holding the balances, but biblical justice means that I should rejoice in what God has given to the other. So, sometimes we don't see the bait and switch. Uh, Christians will, re, will be recruited to the cause of social justice because they know that biblical justice is good, but there is a bait and switch going on. It is unjust when you have billionaires making money off people who have to pee in bottles because they aren't allowed to leave their spot on the floor. It is unjust that we have children starving on the street while these same billionaires put nothing back into society. That's unjust. But to just dismiss it as, oh, they're just envious, does nothing to help the problem. This is because our modern political tangles are a veritable festival of envy. Everywhere you look, everything about it is envious. Communism is envious. Socialism is envious. Feminism is envious. Egalitarianism is envious. Every ism except for prisms is, are envious. <laughs> The prisms are the only good one. <laughs> oh, 
God, that's actually hilarious. So trying to, find, trying to find envy in our political disputes is like trying to find some beads at a New Orleans Mardi Gras parade. Bees? Beads. Beads? Job's not on board. And going back to this concept of sin, the problem with sin is that it is black and white. This thing is wrong and you shouldn't do it. Envy has negative consequences sometimes, therefore envy is always wrong, there is no nuance. But when you start to look at it and you see that obvious nuance, Christians won't acknowledge that the world is in black and white. They start to play the word game. Oh, no, 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 that's not envy, that's coveting. That's not envy, that's jealousy. And I was thinking about this because people have asked me about uh, the difference between jealousy and envy because they're, they're two different things. Sometimes we use those words interchangeably and sometimes because there's a little overlap, if we had a Venn diagram, maybe they'd, you know, kind of, they would, over, they would overlap, but they're not the same thing. Um, jealousy and envy is kind of like uh, stealing versus vandalism. It's a, here's what I mean. Jealousy can be rooted in greed, right? Jealousy can be rooted in a desire to, I will say it like this, to guard what one possesses or what one hopes to possess, right? So, so I want this thing, therefore I'm going to guard this. I want this. I'm going to go after this. Um, I, I overly desire this thing. But here's the interesting thing is jealousy isn't always awful. Jealousy isn't always wrong because um, God says that he is a jealous God. What does that mean? Well, it means that sometimes you, there are some things that are your actual possession. They're your legitimate possession. They're yours. Jealousy wants to keep your house, keep your car, keep, you know, keep your uh, things. Uh, covetousness or greed wants to get them, but without reference to God's law for obtaining things. Envy is worse. Envy is a formidable sin, as our text shows, because it combines its own desires, the covetous part, for the object, and that object could be status or money or women, whatever, with a malicious insistence that the other person lose his possession of it. It's not enough for you to gain it. The other person must lose it. Right? You want to take. You want to take. But if that's what the Bible meant, then the Bible would have said that, right? The longing after someone's stuff or status wouldn't be the problem, but the taking away or the ruining of their lives would be the problem. But it doesn't say that. It says that envy is a sin or coveting is a sin. The New Testament translates the Hebrew word for coveting as the Greek word lust, or we get the word, English word lust from the Greek word, to lust after something. And it's the idea of panting after something. Let's think of animals for a moment. Let's think of dogs. Think of a dog that is panting for something, like his food. You know, first thing a dog thinks of in the morning is food, 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 food. And there's, oh, food, 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 food. And you get the bag and you open it up and you pour it into the dish. They're so excited it's food. And then when they eat that food, you know, that may be the friendliest dog on earth. Don't you dare put your hand in that dog's dish. Because that dog is having its food. And by the way, this applies to men as well. <laughs> We're not all that much different than dogs. I'm joking. I'm joking. There's a difference between jealousy and envy. See, see, envy is like, it's, it's more about like coveting, right? I want your stuff, I want your life. Where jealousy is more about like possessing something. Envy is the one sin that is actually like no fun. Does he think that murder is fun? Like, like if you look at lust, you look at greed, it's like, oh, those people could actually have some fun, right? Like, like the, but envy is kind of one of the things that you're like, you're never gonna have much fun in it. Like the litmus test of how we love our neighbor though, is can we bless them? Can we bless others? Can we encourage others? Can we champion and celebrate other people's wins and promote them versus shriveling inside when someone else is winning? Jealousy is to be possessive of what is lawfully your own. 
Jealousy is to be possessive of what is lawfully yours. Because we are sinners, we sometimes give way to jealousy for wrong causes. Uh, We we, uh, assume that someone's going to try and take something when they weren't going to try and take it. Or in a wrong manner, they were going to try to take it, and we overreact. We're jealous, which we ought to be, but we're jealous in a way that overflows the banks, which we ought not to be. But Scripture is clear that jealousy in itself is not inherently sinful. The Bible tells us that our God is a jealous God. His name is jealous in Exodus 20, verse 5. And in Exodus Exodus 34, verse 14, God's name is jealous. When God's people veer off after idols and they worship idols, God is jealous. When a wife strays from her husband or a husband strays from the wife, the appropriate response is jealousy. Jealousy, an absence of jealousy in that situation would not be virtue, it's, it's rather a sin. It'd be sinful to not be jealous in a circumstance like that. Wanting to keep what is lawfully yours is no sin. I did a full video about the whole jealous God thing, and, and this was a common argument pastors made. And then many polyamorous people in the comments pointed out how ridiculous that argument is, as well as people who, you know, simply trusted their partners. The other thing, too, is that your spouse or your partner does not belong to you. Not in a literal sense, anyway. You can say things like, oh, that's my person, or that's my other half. But at the end of the day, you do not, nor should you, possess another human being. It's mine. Don't touch it. Leave it alone. How does coveting work? The eyes look at an object. The mind admires it. The will goes over to it and the body moves in to possess it. That's coveting. Let's not misunderstand. Let's say your your friend has a car and he just bought it. You go, wow, it's a cool car. Then you go out the next day and buy the same car in the same color. That's not coveting, that's copying. (laughs) See, he still has his car. Now, let's take the same picture. Your friend gets a new car, you go, wow, that's a really cool car, man, I love that. You mind if I sit in it? No, go ahead, you sit in it. Wow, can, can I turn it over? You know, see how fire this engine up? Go ahead, fire it up. Mind if I take a spin around the block? Go ahead, you never come back again. <laughs> that's actually Grand Theft Auto is what that is. That's, uh, that's coveting that's obviously given way to stealing. That, that's coveting that's led to action. Get your own type of car, you weirdo. Not car twins so jealous of the person that the documentary was about because he had won something like 16 Grammys. Whole time I'm watching him, I don't know if you ever do this, I sit there and compare my accomplishments to his accomplishments. And it's like, yeah, but pastor, you touch souls for the kingdom. Well, I want a Grammy too, all right? So I'm sitting there... (laughs) I'm sitting there going... I never won one Grammy. He's got 16 or whatever. But then it was like the Lord spoke to me in the middle of the documentary and said, Wikium. So I put him in my Wikipedia app, and I donate to Wikipedia because they've helped me so much with my research (laughs) every year. And I put his name in the thing, and I saw, yes, he has uh, 16 Grammys, but he also has had five wives. (laughs) <laughs> the wows are my favorite. It's common at this church. He could say the most mundane thing, and someone will yell wow like he just revealed a cure for cancer. I recently heard someone yell wow like that, like a wow, when he said the name of his sermon. Or like when he made this terrible joke and then waits for applause. Jesus was ultimately determined to show the world who he was, but he wasn't going to do it for the gram. So I didn't judge him. I didn't turn off the documentary. I still admire him, but I realized that what I had done in the process of admiring his accomplishments, I had not considered the cost of those accomplishments. Wow. But now they're on a confession. Now here's what's crazy. I've been copying somebody who comes on and tells me I'm actually depressed. And I I've been copying you? I'm actually feel like I'm losing my mind. 
I can't eat. I can't sleep. I was so busy envying your bag that I didn't realize that at the bottom of it is a bottle of pills that you can't function without. Now, ooh, I wish I could feel the energy y'all are putting on me. So maybe be more proud of them because they did something incredible that you envied while dealing with mental illness, and maybe don't write somebody off because they have a mental illness? True, is you look at all the cool people in high school, the jocks, the athletes, the cool guys, and then all the geeks, the computer nerds, the acting goofs. Acting goofs? Listen, we were theater kids, theater geeks, or sometimes theater nerds. We were never called acting goofs. What is that? Right, and they go up through high school, and, and in high school, all the geeks want to be the cool people, right? It's like, I want to be like them. I, I want to be invited to the parties. I want to look cool. I want to be, you know, whatever. Fast forward 20 years. What happens often? Most of the coolios... Does this story take place in a gangster's paradise? ...are working for the geeks. Right? The geeks are the ones who are rich and successful, and they change the world, and the coolios are like, whatever. It's not bad. It's just true. So what are we envying? How deranged is our envy? It's so short-sighted. It is possible to not be envious of someone without saying that you are going to have a better life than them. What's your secret? You know, just be cool. Wait, didn't you wear those pants yesterday? Hey, going home to not change your pants? Bruce, shut pants. <laughs> with these sermons on the seven deadly sins, they usually talk about what the opposite of these sins are. Like with laziness, it's hard work. With greed, it's generosity. And with envy, it's contentment. I've lived with lots, and I've lived with a little, and I've figured out the secret of contentment. And contentment means I know that God loves me so much that I don't want to be like anyone else. Every spiritual master that I know talks about this in the spiritual life. What gives us joy? This capacity to give ourselves utterly to the present moment. As the little flower said, you know, what's the present demand of love? What, what's love demanding of me right now? That's all that matters. Don't get preoccupied with the past. Think of, of envy often looks to the past I and mean, what these people have done and I resent this and I'm still mad about that. Ambition looks to the future, right? What can I do? How can I get ahead? Where am I going? Forget the past and the future. But like a child, be able to live with a kind of beautiful, joyful abandon in the present moment. Enough or hunger. Now you could start feeling envious. They have more. I want more. I don't have enough. They have plenty. And Paul says there's a secret of trust in, in the goodness of God that enables you to feel contentment in, in all that you have. So I think the key is trust him with what he has given us and only ask for things that would honor him more and then be content with what, what God gives. We got to destroy a piece of us. Pick up your cross and follow me. There's no room for envy in the life of a disciple because we fully accept our lives as dead. We deny those lives. And if we don't do that, we'll never know true happiness. But I personally don't think that's the right way to look at it. First of all, contentment sounds pretty boring to me. I mean, I'm somebody who moves around a lot, changes jobs a lot. That's just always been who I am. I like to, I like change. So contentment, wow, that sounds boring. It's fine for a while, but really just being fine with the way things are, just as a way of life, sounds like a wasted life to me. So no, I, I don't think the counter to envy is contentment. I think the counter to envy is empathy. Envy says, I want that person's life. Empathy says, I want to understand that person's life. Envy says, I wish I was a billionaire. Empathy says, who gets hurt on the way to that goal? What's the cost? Hey, has anyone seen Jeff Bezos? Is the fight over? Guys! <laughs> ah, this is why I don't allow bathroom breaks! 
Envy says it's not fair. Empathy says, how can we make it fair? The problem is the doctrine of sin doesn't know how empathy works. There is no room for empathy. Things that may cause bad outcomes are classified as sin, so therefore anybody who does these things are a bad person. But that's just not how the world works. So in the process, these people who have these beliefs lose empathy. It's probably why evangelicals seem to be the least empathetic group you will ever meet. At the end of the day, it's probably not a good idea to always compare yourself to people. But also, some people can inspire you, and some people are goals. And that's okay, too. You're not a sinner for, you know, having a little envy, and you're not a bad person to say, hey, I want to be like that guy. Just make sure you're loving people, make sure you're being kind, and uh, you're the best. Everybody, thank you so much for making it this far. If you liked what you saw, uh, maybe send it to somebody who may benefit from watching it. And uh, thank you so much. You are all wonderful people. And sex is bad because it leads to kids and kids could grow up to be dancers and then dancers go on to be kissers. Oh yeah, no, just don't dance.